and we're live. Hi, Alexis. Hello. How are you today, Rachel? I'm quite well. I'm feeling very in my heart space right now about this um, topic we're going to talk about, which I'll get you to introduce in a second. But how are you going? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can feel that also. Um, perhaps it's relevant to today's topic. Um, we're discussing chronic conditions. So whether you have a chronic condition or you know someone who does, uh, we hope you find value in the, the empathy and, um, you know, positioning yourself in, in the shoes of uh, someone with a chronic condition. Um, and there are certainly aspects that we can all relate to uh, around, oh, wow, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack. Um, but uh, I, was, I was interested to start in um, hearing your perspective on the value of labels, Rachel, because working in the mental health space, um, I can see a place for them and yet I can see a place to let them go. So what are your thoughts? Oh, that's such a great question. Yeah, this is um, really relevant to both you and I, um, both this issue of working with people with chronic conditions, because I know both of us do work with those sort of clientele. And yeah, it's a great question about the, the value of diagnostic labels. Mm -hmm. And it comes up in my work a lot, that question. And, and with my supervision of my early career, colleagues and I find myself saying the same thing these days which is that a label a diagnostic label whether it's uh, psychiatric or medical physical um, is only useful if it helps us view ourselves more compassionately um, so certainly in psychology I have many 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 times seen labels or diagnoses diagnoses help people view themselves through a kind of more compassionate lens you know if they realize they've got autism and they didn't know until now or ADHD or some other diagnosable condition that's been severely uh, impacting their lives it's like a relief and I think it's similar for a lot of people with medical conditions when you finally get that diagnosis it can be a huge relief because then it points your focus in the direction of treatment and that should only ever be the purpose of a diagnosis, not to bring about shame or judgment, but to point our focus in the right direction with regards to our options. What do you think? Yeah, I hadn't heard that. I, I like that, um, that awareness of being able to narrow my scope once I have a, a, a label, rather than having to look at absolutely everything. Mm. Um, the, the other thing that comes to mind is, is the discussion that we had last, I think it was last week, on the drama triangle and um, that to recognise ourselves in a particular position can help us to, to put language and understanding and, and see ourselves and yet the over-identification, and I would say it's the same with labels, an over-identification with a label to the point that I, it's, you know, I, mm. I can't let it go. I think that could be... A real hindrance. Exactly. I agree with that. I think it's part of me. It's one way of seeing myself. It's not me. It's not all of me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there's the language around this is really important. You know, I experience symptoms of depression is a very different statement to I am a depressive person. Mm -hmm. So language counts here and the way we think about our condition um, mm -hmm. and how we relate to it and make sure we see it. Um, as not who we are, not defining us, but something that we kind of have to live with perhaps and make friends with and accept and work with, which is what we're going to talk about, right? Absolutely. Even, um, even the value of feedback from the body is something that I've learned is necessary for all of us, whether we have a chronic condition or not. All of us have this constant feedback in the form of sensation and that that has real value. Mm. Um, you've taught me the value of sensation and giving me feedback around my emotions and my needs. Mm. And I think it's the same for our, our physical needs. Um, yeah. The, yeah, the need for rest, the need for nutrition. Uh, they're all contained in the very sensation itself. So 
Uh, certainly, I am really interested in shifting the um, the avoidance kind of mentality, um, which interestingly, I hadn't really connected the two before, but it's the very same thing that we do with emotional embracing um, that we can do with our sensorial, our physical embracing. Um, yeah, you're talking yeah. about the compassionate, compassionate embracing process. Yes, but specific to physical sensation. Yeah, yeah no, I think that's, that's really, really important. I once had a client who had a um, a, a lot of problems with his spine. I'm sure you've had many of those clients as well. And he 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 imagined his spine as these broken train tracks. Oh. And he had a very kind of um, adversarial relationship with his own spine. But what I got him to do was start visualizing the train tracks kind of coming together and green foliage growing around them. And he, you know, he used this visualization to and and to be kind to his spine we worked a fair bit on you know his relationship and attitude towards his own spine because he was still very stuck in the stage of anger about his physical condition and I could sense that his resentment and anger and frustration that he understandably felt about his issues with his spine were adding more tension and stress Mm -hmm. So teaching him different ways to compassionately embrace or bring compassion to his experience, mm. you know, it didn't fix the world, of course, there's a reality to the body, but it did help to relax some of that, you know, anger and resentment and, and bring more acceptance to his reality. Uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd be interested in um, in any conditions that our viewers might be experiencing, so that we can yeah. you know, speak to you directly and um, give examples, specific examples. Right. So, if you're willing, if you're listening and you're willing to put in the comments uh, a chronic condition, obviously don't feel you have to. But if you're willing to mention a chronic condition that you have lived with in the past or do live with now, um, please feel free to share. Because when we say chronic condition, we mean anything that's sort of going on for some time that's interfering in some way or impacting your life. So it could be psychiatric, it could be medical, it could be because of an injury or something else. Mm. Um, as you're talking about the anger and the resentment, um, you know, I, I'm really interested to have a look at the, the five stages of, of grieving again, because particularly when, when someone receives a diagnosis, uh, and, and that can happen at, at any age of life, um, there, is, there, is a, there is a process uh, of coming to terms with that and, and the grief of the life that is not going to be, um, that I need to accept certain disability and certain limitations yeah which again we can all we can all relate to um but uh yeah would you like to share that mm. those five stages with us Rachel I, I would but first of all I'd like to acknowledge Mia thank you for sharing that you live with Ross River virus Ross with river fever I know of a couple of people who've who've gone through that and I know how debilitating that can be mm. I think that um those of us who don't live currently with a chronic condition of the body can easily slip into a false sense of control. You know, it's e I know I can. It's easy to get frustrated when we have, when we realize we have limitations and we realize we don't have control over, uh, you know, things in our lives, relationships, um, even our own mind and our own feelings can, you know, take us by surprise. Um, those living with a chronic condition are facing in a way that the rest of us are not every day usually they're facing the limitations mm -hmm. of the ego the ego that wants to and and is quite functional in this way wants to take charge wants to plan wants to control wants to influence wants to operate in the world um, but the ego doesn't like reaching its limits and the answer being no you can't do that. You don't have the physical capacity to do that. You don't have the energy to do that. I know you want to go to that party, but you can't. 
you know, and I, we've all faced this with COVID at some point as well, that the, the, the disappointment that can kick in, but before the sadness and the disappointment, deep and deep, deep disappointment, the stages are normally, there is a sequence to it. Normally there is shock, disbelief, and some kind of denial early on. You know, we can't quite believe this is happening. We can't quite believe it's true. You know, and this is a normal experience because our brains are so complicated and it does take time for the linkages to be made between the different parts of the brain, which when they happen is when we're starting to get closer to acceptance. But at first, our brain has not caught up. So we are in a kind of disbelief and shock um, and denial. And, and the, the, the evolutionary function of that is in the shock state, we can go into survival mode. And that's actually a good thing in many ways because we start looking outside of ourselves for options. It's like when somebody passes away and we think, right, where are the wills, organize the funeral, blah, 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 all the practical things. Often when we get um, a diagnosis, we go into, well, what are my options? Which treatments do I get? How do I deal with this? And that's obviously very wise to do in the beginning. However, at some stage, well, not however, and at some stage, other emotions or our emotions will kick in once the shock has subsided and anger might kick in. You know, this is not fair. Um, we're hitting up against our limits now and we can't have what we want. And the, um, the anger stage, you know, is an important one to acknowledge and honor and work through. Um, the third stage of the traditional grieving model is bargaining. And that's more cognitive. Like, why is this happening to me? If only I'd looked after myself better. If only I hadn't gone camping and got bitten by that mosquito and got Ross River fever. If only, if only, if only. That's another part of the grieving. And at some point, we sink into an important kind of hopelessness. It's a creative hopelessness where we give up on the idea that we have you know, more control than we actually do. Mm. It's, it's a healthy hopelessness because we start to accept the reality. Mm. We, and we, we really start to grieve and feel sometimes a bit depressed and that's okay. We start to feel really sad mm. that, yes, this is how it is and I, I have lost something here. Mm. Maybe there are many things I have lost Mm -hmm. And we must let ourselves grieve that. I can't say enough about how important going into our sadness and grief is. Yeah, I can um, <clears throat> very much relate to that. The need to go into the sadness and, and the grief, and it's, it's quite a guttural experience. So I was recently, um, there's recently been quite a lot of sadness and grief coming up for me, and I was wanting to move towards it to kind of complete it, you know, seeking that full resolution. And in looking for the word, uh, in, in that moment, the word was, was gutted. I just felt really <laughs> gutted, like my guts had just been emptied out of me, but it felt at least more complete than um, this semi kind of sadness, this semi kind of dipping in, but but trying to keep myself buoyant, you know, and then dropping in every so often, but, you know, trying to cheer myself up. The, yeah, the, the resolution, the completeness of, uh, of grief is mm. how deeply satisfying. It's like a cleanse. It's like a, uh, a full release. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, such an important part of the recovery. Mia has mentioned the anxiety and the depression, the psychological struggles that go with living with, a, it's not just physical. You know, a lot of medical doctors will forget the psychological, you know, they'll treat the medical. And a lot of my clients say, it's, a, it's the psychological and emotional elements of this condition that are actually more difficult than the physical. Mm. Um, and so I agree with you, Mia. And so the, there can be some stigma that you receive, like a sense of, well, just live with it, suck it up. There is not this acknowledgement of the genuine grief the genuine sense of being gutted, the genuine loss. And someone else mentioned, Elizabeth mentioned the associated anxiety as well. And that is um, when it comes to living with a chronic condition, 
from what I've read, this they add the anxiety and fear and worry as another stage because so much anxiety can come up about, will I have to live with this forever? What does my future look like? Mm -hmm. You know, we can easily understandably catastrophize and start to predict the future and it's all bad. Mm -hmm. And that can be overwhelming, that anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's into um, something that, uh, that, I, that I wanted to raise, which I think is associated with the anxiety, and that is our need for contribution and competence that can be hindered when, when we're living with chronic illness. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned that because the question people can ask themselves is, well, what is the fear? And that could very well be a significant fear. Mm -hmm. That's right. Am I able to contribute? Which um, I think there's, there's two aspects to it. There's, a, there's an innate urge or an innate need to contribute, which I think is probably built on our biological need to belong to, to our families, to our communities, uh, and, and that social acceptance that comes with it. But there is also a cultural expectation that, you know, for a certain period of our lives, uh, you know, let's say leaving school until retirement, um, there is a, an expectation that we contribute. And I think if there is, if, if that's somehow compromised, um, we need to, we need to look deeply into where our sense of self-worth comes from. Uh, I know there was periods in my life, even, you know, in the postnatal period where I really struggled with <laughs> where's my worth come from uh, when I'm not contributing economically. That was a very, very deep struggle. Uh, and, you know, I, I even ended up asking myself the question, how would this be if I was disabled? If I was mentally and physically disabled, I could not contribute to, uh, to my society. How would, I, how would I have a sense of my own value and my own worth? And where I landed ultimately mm. was that presence makes a difference uh, and, and that our worth lies in our presence. I agree. I couldn't agree with you more. Well, quick little story that I'll tell you, which touched my heart. My grandmother died about 10 years ago at the age of 95. And um, she had many shortcomings as a human being, but she was very gentle and sweet and loving. And she was lying completely incapacitated at the age of 94 or so in the bed and she said, it's, it's so sad for me, Rachel, because I can't even get up to make somebody a cup of tea when they come to visit me. Mm -hmm. And when she could still get up and pour somebody a cup of tea, she felt like she could contribute something. Uh, and I asked her a question about that, you know, so how do you kind of deal with the fact that you, she couldn't even get out of bed by herself? And she said, well, I figure that I'm giving the people who work here a job and if I, you know, they've, they've got employment because of me. And if I smile at them and say, thank you, then that makes their day a bit brighter. And so even in her incapacitated state in the bed in the nursing home, she was still able to find a sense that she was giving something to somebody. Um, I never forgot that little conversation um, because she was able to reframe it, even in her state. And um, I've just posted in the comments for people a great article about Frida Kahlo and it's called Exploring Frida Kahlo's Relationship to Her Own Body. And have a look at that article because she lived with so many chronic conditions. She had such a tragic life from a medical and physical point of view. But most of us know Frida Kahlo's paintings. And she set herself up in bed and she painted and she did self-portraits. She asked them to... Um, put a mirror on the ceiling so she could see herself in the mirror on the ceiling and she would do self-portraits. She did dozens of self-portraits from the mirror on the ceiling. Yeah. And she had not wanted to be a painter. She'd wanted to be a doctor, but mm -hmm. she had a bit of talent around painting. So she found a way to have some meaningful expression and creativity and fun while stuck in bed. Mm -hmm. And she's just, to me, the avatar of inspiration for somebody who lives with chronic conditions. And that's not to put pressure on anybody to, you know, like learn 10 languages during lockdown or anything like that. But this idea that we can still work at finding meaning and purpose and contribution 
somehow, mm. even with our chronic condition, and that if we have dark thoughts that, you know, life, people would be better off without me, which some of my clients have expressed, mm-hmm. you know, the unrelenting nature of the pain or the depression, you know, the thing I sometimes say to them is if you took your own life, it really would be a waste of your talents, of your personality, of the things that you have to contribute to the world. And then we go looking for what those are because we all have our signature strengths, every single one of us. Yes, the meaning making, I love that you've um, brought that up because that is what a creative practice helps us to do. Mm helps us to make sense of the experience even though we may feel completely alone uh, that that somehow we can connect some dots about you know what what experience does this bring up for me Uh, how how does this relate to my childhood experiences what does this mean for me how do I need to creatively adapt to Mm. allow for this to be here in my life how does it impact my relationships uh, you know my career and to be creative around it. So I feel strongly that a creative practice is, is essential really for anybody living with a chronic condition uh, for that very purpose. Um, and that reminds me um, of what Joe has said here around that it's tiring to tell the story again and again. It is um, tiring. And, yes. And that... Um, uh, I know some of the, uh, the, the podcasts that you and I listen to, um, one of the practitioners talks about the value of sharing our story and that if we can somehow just tell it even a little bit different, that we might have a different perspective on it and that ultimately we're, we're almost drying it up. We're drying up the story. Bringing it, bringing it out. <laughs> bringing it out, yeah, so that it, it doesn't have the same emotional content. But there's value in telling the story. Again, it's a creative process. It's a narrative therapy in a way. And if I can just be aware of how I'm telling it, perhaps noticing, am I using the same words? Am I bored of this? Then maybe, maybe I need to go deeper with it or shed a different light on it. Well, maybe if I'm starting to get bored with my pain story, maybe I've come to a greater place of acceptance. You know, it's um, the number one therapy, I was telling you before we started recording, the number one therapy for chronic pain and chronic conditions that we're advised to use currently is called acceptance and commitment therapy. The acceptance part is practicing profound acceptance, which we all know is one hell of a challenge. But to practice profound acceptance of that which we want to push away, you know, we, we, we tend to do one of two things. We either ignore it and push it back into the shadows. We deny it. We want to get rid of it or we let it control us and we indulge in self-pity and trying to use it to kind of tragically get our needs for attention and care met. But unfortunately, we're in a disempowered position where we are stuck in in the hopelessness, in the victim mindset, in the sense of out, being out of control and lacking agency. These are the two things I see in my clinical practice, either complete denial or complete in, indulgence. Um, and the third path, the middle path, is to face it. Hard to do, I know. Face it fully, be with it, stay with it, and accept it. Um, and this is not just a thing that you've done and then you're done this is like constant right ongoing acceptance 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 okay I noticed the resistance I noticed the indulgence now I'm going to go be with it here now be with it stay with it and in the process of acceptance interestingly something happens we open up some more space inside of ourselves psychologically and in that space we can bring in meaning connection contribution purposeful living you know, it's only it's only under the conditions of more acceptance that we can commit, hence acceptance and commitment therapy, we can commit to living by our values um, a little bit more. I hope that makes sense, that summary. That was quite, quite deep, actually, Rachel, um, and reminds me, you know, that um, of the value of getting quite granular with our experience and the the need, you know, as you've said, to sit with it, 
even mentally move towards it, come to know it at a very granular level. Um, and that, that's such an interesting process because there's both a sense of it being universal as in, well, every human being on the planet has sensation within the body. And some of it is pleasant, some of it is unpleasant, but that experience is universal. Uh, and, and it's also deeply personal and intimate. It's, um, uh, but I, I do I agree with you that, um, you know, the Buddhist principles are very, very relevant when we're talking about chronic conditions because there's a need to embrace and to be with, even breathe to, to learn to build that tolerance and capacity. And yet there's also that need to know where is my where is my true identity? And, and it's not it's not here. It's not even in this body. Ultimately, we'll be letting go of this body. We'll be letting go of these sensations, which is, is all we've known. But there is something. There, there is something. There is something that's able to observe the sensations, which means I am not these sensations. I am something more. Mm. And that is easy to say. And it's such a practice because it can be so challenging to have any sense of transcendence when either our intrusive thoughts in the case of an anxiety disorder or depression or our physical sensations in the case of a chronic condition can be so intense and so intrusive and so overwhelming. Um, and, you know, and there's a trauma. I would like to name this as well. There can be a kind of trauma in, um, in living with a chronic condition. It's like a slow burn trauma. You know, trauma may be anything that overwhelms our coping resources mm -hmm. and chronic conditions can certainly do that. And we don't have to end up with post-traumatic stress disorder either. We can end up with post-traumatic growth. And so many of my clients, I'm pleased to report, do experience what we label post-traumatic growth. They say, I wouldn't wish this cancer or I wouldn't wish this diabetes or I wouldn't wish this MS or whatever it is or depression. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But after however many years and practicing acceptance and really learning to listen and really letting go and accepting my limit limitations, I have actually gained a lot as well. And I'm grateful like I've even had clients say, I'm grateful for my chronic condition. Not that I'd wish it on anybody, but I've grown from it. Mm -hmm. And it's changed my perspective and it's helped me transcend my ego in certain ways because the ego does not like any of it. It doesn't want to have a bar of any of it, of course. So this really chafes up against our ego, our egoic mind, which says, I hate this. I don't want this. I can't do this. I'm bad, they're bad, everything's bad. You know, the ego can be quite um, obstructive in that way. Um, and gee, there's nothing like a chronic condition to help us meet the dark side of our ego. And that can be an opportunity to really look inside. Yeah, as you're talking, I'm remembering my um, early experiences of, of yoga when um, I had to learn about my own limitations. And, and I think for many, a yoga class can be that, that first opportunity to recognise, well, hang on a minute, I, I can't do what that person next to me is doing. And where other sports might, yeah, it is okay. Oh, darling, you're mute. Um, did you accidentally mute yourself? How's that? Can you hear me? I can, thank you. But yeah, I often find that um, a, a yoga session is the first, first time someone has really come into contact with their limitations. Mm -hmm. And I think other forms of exercise kind of brush over it. Um, and, but yoga actually brings it front and centre and, and helps us to recognise, okay, well, I can't, I can't balance with my leg up there, but I can balance with my leg down there and that's an ongoing process that we need to revisit again and again and again until we're 95 like your grandmother but the fact that there's an opportunity in that um, not only to get creative and, and need to adapt um, but also what's occurring to me is that there's a vulnerability in our limitations and that that yeah. that, that that is a strength I'm thinking about a client yesterday who um, who's had chronic rheumatoid arthritis, severe for a couple of decades uh, and, and now diabetes. 
and and really riddled with pain. She's lived with pain every day. Uh, but but that there's a certain yeah there's a definite vulnerability in her that she's starting to um, she's starting to own and and even stand in and see that yeah see it as a strength. <laughs> Uh, perhaps that is the value of of illness. I really I believe that it is. You know, building our capacity for vulnerability is so important. It's so hard, but it's so important because the alternative is that our sense of self and sense of safety gets smaller. It shrinks as we get older, and nobody really wants that. I think we've all met people who are a bit older and kind of small minded and really kind of resistant or cynical or something. And I don't think we'd wish that on anybody. So really the challenge is to actually get more comfortable with vulnerability. And there's nothing like a chronic condition, as I said, to kind of really, really invite us to face the vulnerability of our own limitations, as you said. And yet, you know, doing a practice like yoga or meditation or going to see a therapist and speaking your feelings and vulnerabilities all of these practices are about slowly with committed persistence building some capacity increasing our capacity and it's such a celebration if you can suddenly you know touch your toes when you couldn't before and it's such a celebration for me as a therapist when my clients can speak their feelings to somebody in their life when they couldn't before. You know, I have a, an invisible streamer button. When someone does something that anyone else would think was banal and I think is just wonderful, I press my invisible streamer button and then the invisible streamers flow from the ceiling because <laughs> I want to celebrate any increase in capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and living with a chronic condition doesn't mean you're powerless most of the time, hence why I love the archetype of Frida Kahlo um, you know she kept being resourceful and finding ways to do things that you know would um, keep her busy uh, help contribute to the world and she did and so we don't want to decide we don't want to go into denial but we don't want to decide that we're powerless either but it, until we face the reality and our vulnerability, I don't believe we can um, find our power to act. So, yeah, there's such a process here. You know, it's like doctors can look at a person with a chronic condition and go, okay, this is what you've got to do. They don't see the psychological process, but I do. And it's huge. And I'd like to acknowledge that. Mm. Yeah, as, as we're talking about vulnerability, um, and thank you for acknowledging it, you know, um, yeah, that alone, just just the, the, the matter of factness, the acknowledgement uh, is, is uh, enlightening, it lightens the experience to share it. Uh, and as we're talking about vulnerability, I'm reminded that um, there are many people who are actually um, have COVID right now. Uh, and so people who are in lockdown are going to be experiencing exactly what we're talking about in terms of limitations, uh, you know, compromise to their sense of competence or ability to contribute. Um, and it also brings to mind man flu. And, you know, that that, that may well be, uh, even in, a, in an acute phase, that resistance to vulnerability, you know, that, um, that stoic, typically typically male it's not always but that stoic individual who almost refuses to be unwell or you know won't let anybody know when they're unwell um it it says to me that illness serves to connect us to our vulnerability and not only that but but even our dependence because we're we're all going to be dependent yeah. at some stage of our lives yeah, exactly. And so we all need to face the possibility of deterioration. Over 70% of people die slowly. You know, a lot of shows suggest that deaths occur suddenly through accidents or a diagnosis of something severe and they're dead a week later. But the research actually shows the vast majority of, majority of us will decline as we approach death. So actually this issue of chronic conditions and living with them and finding grace 
and finding acceptance and reframing and reframing so you stay in your humanity and your need for um, meaning, contribution and connection. Uh, this is going to be relevant to all of us one day. Um, yes. And if we're not willing to be vulnerable, then there's some medical research that shows men are less likely to go to the doctor and therefore more likely to die of treatable diseases. And it's all to do with vulnerability. It's all to do with an unwillingness or an inability to be vulnerable enough to go to the doctor and say, hey, doc, I think there's something going on. I think I have a problem. So, yeah, vulnerability very much comes into every stage of, of a chronic condition from the very first glimmer right through to full acceptance. Um, there's a lovely quote uh, comment here from Terry. Can you see that one there, Alexis? Uh, I didn't, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, commenting on, um, Terry's commenting on post-traumatic growth, which is a, it's a great term. Yeah, and, 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 the, and the cyclone, you know, and the cyclone triggering the PTSD, but how it's also helped accept, helped you accept your limitations. I mean, wise people accept their limitations because what's the alternative? So well done. Yeah, I like... Um, Katie's mention of acceptance and adaptation, which pretty much sums, sums it up. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of work and it's a real process. Acceptance is one word and it takes me one second to say the word, but the actual process of acceptance is a daily practice. You, go, you have bad days and good days and it's such a process. And But bit by bit by bit, we get closer towards acceptance and it involves accepting all the stages of grief, all the emotions, the shame, the guilt, the fear, the anxiety, the anger, the, the uncertainty, the confusion. All of these feelings need to be acknowledged and accepted as fully human if we are to work towards um a more accepting position, a more accepting sort of place within ourselves. And I have to add to acceptance because it's been so powerful for me and I've shared it with that to couple with acceptance, I think is the term rehabilitation. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, in accepting that I have a body that I'm going to have to take care of for the rest of my life. Yep. Uh, I need to accept that there's going to be constant rehabilitation, that I need to be in a, in a communication with the symptoms of my body, the sensations of my body, and that that can enable a more empowered experience. So while I, I do think acceptance is key, um, there's a difference. I'm thinking about it. Um, a young woman recently who came to me for period pain and um, uh, we did some yoga together. And then when she came back, she said to me, you know, it was, it was just a bit easier to manage this time around. And I said, well, you know, what was the difference? And she said, the difference was that instead of lying on my back, I, I curled over and I got into a child pose. So the difference was one between the experience happening to her or her being able to respond, actively take mm. some step to work with her body. So rather than, again, you know, like the body being the enemy, it was, okay, I'm choosing now to work with you. And mm. yoga has taught me that that's a constant and never-ending communication. And it is towards rehabilitation, rehabilitation, moving toward balance as best we can again and again and again. Yeah. Of course. I agree. Yeah, no, it, it reminds me of the difference between, you know, having your issues or your issues having you you know there's this sort of passivity of like oh my body's doing this thing to me or I can hold it I can hold this I can contain this it's not easy and I I don't like it and I don't have to like it but I can hold it gently and with compassion you know I can contain this I can be with it and tolerate it that's a different relationship Mm. And yeah, there's many ways that we can use our body and our mind mm. to do this practice. So yeah, I agree with you. And just on that, because I'm aware of time, but um, 
you know, I, I have found that there are certain themes that underlie all, well, they're common to all chronic conditions. Uh, and um, this is supported by um, Yabor Mate. You know, he actually believes that all chronic conditions stem back to childhood trauma. And he has quite a, quite a body of evidence to, to show that link. Uh, but a, a teacher of mine, um, Simon borg -Livier, a yoga teacher, um, says that he, he believes that it all, all chronic illness stems back to sympathetic dominance, the sympathetic nervous system being in a hyper state. And I would have to say that in yeah, 20 or more years as a clinician, uh, stress is underlying chronic conditions. And um, or, need... or, it, or it makes that like I've worked with people who've had injury and the injury is at a physical level, some damage to the body, but the, 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 the threat physiology, which is what I've come to call it, just the physiology of the threat response. Yes. Um, yeah, I think over many, many years can create a chronic condition or a chronic condition can happen. And then the threat physiology makes it worse. Makes it, yeah, that's right. Well, we know, I mean, physios talk about the fear, tension, pain cycle. The yeah. tension causes the, the pain. Um, so I did want to just mention that, you know, there, there's always ways to, to work at the level of stress and to shift toward a more relaxed uh, state of nervous system. And equally, there's always ways to work on dampening our inflammation. Uh, and there's a lot of research to suggest that um, both inflammation and disturbance to the microbiome uh, mm -hmm. is, again, common to almost all chronic conditions. So... I just wanted to add that there's, you know, there's always something, there's always something that we can do alongside acceptance and that, that little bit of uh, engagement, empowerment, I think makes the difference um, psychologically as well. Empowerment. And I just want to answer one more question before we finish up. Louisa has asked, asked, how do we find acceptance for our limitations in a society that only rewards productivity? <laughs> And uh, I mean, we can't change society, but we can find empowerment in our own little piece of the world in our lives. I mean, we do what we can. That's true for all of us. And there is a sadness if we can't do nearly as much as we'd like to. But all of us do have limitations. And look, I've even worked with CEOs who've burned out, gone bankrupt and suddenly had to face their own chronic conditions, their own limitations. So none of us is immune in the end to this. I guess I like to be a rebel and subvert the expectations of society and excavate my own psyche for the unconscious expectations so that I can challenge them and they no longer disempower me by having power over me. So I want to sort of connect to what you just said, Alexis, which is we can find our agency. We aren't completely powerless. We never don't have choice. And so it's in that sphere of control and choice that we need to live and try and stay there. That's the only answer, really. Worrying about things outside of our control like society will just send anybody crazy. <laughs> That's right. And come and hang with our community where we value contribution in all its many forms. <laughs> Yeah. including presence and Just community presence. and support yes support okay. so that, could you put a link to our march retreat in the comments later on please yes i'll do that straight away i'll also put a link to um to our community page uh where you can yeah you can let us know your story um thank you so much for watching everybody it's um yeah look it's relevant for everybody this topic uh so please um yeah, forward it on if you know friends or family that have chronic conditions that you feel may benefit from hearing uh, our discussion today. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you, Dr. Rachel. Always, oh always God. very valuable to hear your voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look forward oh. to seeing you same time, same place. Likewise. Yes, good. Okay, thanks, everybody. See you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.